Okay, so hello everyone and thank you so much for joining today. Um, thank you for the organizers for the invitation to speak today. And as you've mentioned, I am now the head of the newly established uh, Ancient DNA Laboratory at the Sackler Faculty of Medicine in Tel Aviv University. And before that, as part of my research um, in Leipzig at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, I worked a lot on archaic hominins, Neanderthals and Denisovans. And I, today I'd like to talk to you a bit about what I've learned about these archaic hominins during my research. So Neanderthals first appeared in Western Europe about 430,000 years ago, and they gradually spread throughout Europe, the Middle East, and the Western part of Asia until they disappeared about 40,000 years ago. Neanderthals can be distinguished from ancient modern humans by a suite of morphological features. However, and this is something I'll come back to, it is quite rare in the archaeological records to find full, well-preserved skeletons of ancient humans. And so typically, the past presence of these hominins at archaeological sites is it deduced based on the type of stone tools that these people left behind. And it is these type of findings, the skeletal remains and the stone tools that have fueled debates about Neanderthals ever since they've been discovered. Debates about their origins, their morphology, their cognitive ability, their behavior, as well as whether they or not they interacted with ancient modern humans. And for the last 20 years, the, ab the ability to recover DNA from ancient skeletal remains have allowed geneticists to weigh in on these questions. And indeed, one of the main insights that came out of the sequencing of the first neonatal genome was that everybody that is of non-Sub-Saharan ancestry living today carries traces of neonatal ancestry in their own genome, on average about one to 2%. And the way that this was interpreted was that as ancient modern humans came out of Africa some 50,000 years ago or so, they met Neanderthals that were already outside of the continent, possibly in the Middle East, and interbred with them. And then these ancient modern humans spread throughout the world, migrated throughout the world, carrying with them these traces of Neanderthal ancestry. In 2010, at the site of Denisova Cave, a site in Siberia that is at the edge of the known Neanderthal world, um, a fragment of a um, finger bone belonging to a juvenile, juvenile individual was discovered. And when the DNA of this individual was sequenced, something very unexpected was found. It was found that this individual um, fell outside of the variation of Neanderthal genomes. In fact, this individual and Neanderthals were equally distant to people living today. In other words, this individual came from a previously unknown population of archaic hominins, which were a sister group to Neanderthals. And based on the same analogy that um, Neanderthals were called Neanderthals since they were first found in the Neander Valley, this group of hominins were then called the Denisovans. Denisovans also left traces of their genomes in people living today, most commonly in Oceania and to a lesser extent in Southeast Asia. And from this, it was inferred that while Neanderthals lived in the West, Denisovans lived in the East, although the exact extent of their range is unknown. Now, since 2010, only three other um, remains have been identified as Denisovans based on their DNA, all of them from Denisova Cave. And more recently, last year, a partial mandible that was found at the site of Baishia Cave in the Tibetan Plateau was tentatively attributed to Denisovan or Denisovan-like group based on a single amino acid substitution in its collagen sequence. Now, one of the reasons that um, we have trouble identifying Denisovans and also um, sometimes Neanderthals is based on the sheer nature of a prehistoric archaeological excavation. So to make this point, I'd like to take you on a sort of virtual tour of a typical excavation from this time period. 
And if you were excavating at a prehistoric site, what you'll find most often are these stone tools that I've already mentioned. You'll probably also find a lot of animal bones, sometimes carrying marks of having been butchered, processed by the ancient humans. And then maybe, just maybe, you'll find one, two, or a handful of skeletal remains of the hominins themselves. But if you think about it, what you find the most is simply the sediment in which all these other finds are buried. And so based on previous evidence that DNA can survive in sediments over several millennia, back in 2017, we asked ourselves, could we um, retrieve hominin DNA directly from the archaeological sediments, even when skeletal remains are not found? So to test this, um, this possibility, we collected 85 sediment samples from seven archaeological sites across Europe. And these are all sites where, based on the archaeological record, we knew that hominins once lived. And these are from sediments from layers dated to between 14,000 and over 600,000 years ago. We then took these sediment samples and using a methodology that we developed, um, extracted DNA, isolated DNA of mammalian um, species, speci specifically the mitochondrial DNA, and then used a methodology to authenticate whether these come from ancient or um, DNA or present day contamination. And using this method, we were able to show that um, we were able to retrieve ancient DNA in sediments in six out of the seven sites that we um, looked at. The only site where this did not work, Côte de l'Arago in southern France, these sediment samples were older than the other sediment samples by several hundreds of thousands of years. So here I'm showing you a snapshot of the taxa that we identified at the sites. Um, overall, we identified mammalian mitochondrial DNA from 12 different families. And these include taxa that are now extinct, but that one would expect in a Pleistocene context, for example, the woolly mammoth, the woolly rhino, the cave bear, or the cave hyena. And this is already interesting by itself for people working on um, ancient zoology or um, ancient archaeology in general, since this allows us in some ways to help to reconstruct the environment in which ancient hominins lived. However, of course, we were interested in the ancient hominins. And by targeting using hybridization-based capture, human mitochondrial DNA in the sediment samples that we collected, we were able to find traces of ancient hominin mitochondrial DNA in four of these sites. We then created additional DNA extracts and additional DNA libraries from all of the positive samples, allowing us to reconstruct between partial and full mitochondrial DNA genome sequences from nine sediment set samples deposited at these four sites. And we could then compare these to mitochondrial DNA genomes that had been previously um, reconstructed using fossilized remains. And when we did that, we saw that for eight of the sediment samples, the mitochondrial DNA that we recovered from the sediment falls within the variation of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. However, for the last sample that was collected at the niece of a cave, the mitochondrial DNA in the sediment clustered with the niece of mitochondrial DNA. In other words, by collecting nine sediment samples from four archeological sites, we were able to retrace the vast majority of the mitochondrial DNA diversity that was previously known from Pleistocene hominins. Our finding of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA at the site of El Cidron in Spain and Chakilska cave in Russia coincides well with the archeological record in the sense that these comes from layers that are very rich in Neanderthal skeletal remains. However, at Tourelves in Belgium, we recover Neanderthal DNA in a layer where previously no hominin remains have ever been found, and where the presence of Neanderthals could only be inferred um, until then based on a type of stone tools that were found. Lastly, I'll come back to the niece of a cave, and here I'm showing you a sketch of the stratigraphy of the site uh, with the black lines del delimitating uh, the layers as they are defined by the archaeologists. 
And as you're closer to the top, you're closer to present day time. And as we go down the stratigraphy, we go further, further back in time. So we found Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in the layer where previously a Neanderthal bone had been found. But we also find Neanderthal as well as Denisovan mitochondrial DNA deeper in the stratigraphy, allowing us to see that both groups of hominins were present in the region of the Altai Mountains for longer than previously thought based on the skeletal record. So this was a good proof of concept for us that the methodology that we've developed indeed allows us to um, look for hominin mitochondrial DNA in sediments, even when skeletal remains are not there. And we applied this method to a large array of archeological sites with one of the um, of the motivations being to look for Denisovan DNA outside of Denisova cave. Now, luckily, um, a team from the Chinese Academy of Sciences went to Baixia cave and sampled their sediments from eight of the layers at the site. And using methodology um, similar to the one we developed in 2017, they were able to show the preservation of ancient DNA in six of these layers out of which in four layers, they found ancient hominin mitochondrial DNA. And when we look at these data, we saw that the hominin mitochondrial DNA that they recovered shown here by the um, name of the site plus the name of the layer here, here, and here, all clusters with Denisovan mitochondrial DNA. This constitutes the first genetic evidence for Denisovan's outside of Denisova cave, and based on the dating of these layers, shows that Denisovans were present in the Tibetan plateau repeatedly from 100,000 years ago until at least 45,000 years ago. Now I've talked a lot about sediments, um, but another source of potential um, uh, DNA from archaic hominins is also the vast numbers of skeletal remains that are too small or too fragmented to be identified based on their morphology. As among these um, hundreds of bones, there could be um, hominin bones hiding in there. So one way to quickly and relatively cheaply screen these bone fragments to look for hominins is a method called zooms or zooarchaeology by mass spectrometry. This is a method by which collagen is extracted and using peptide mass fingerprinting compared to a database in order to um, identify the taxa from which um, each bone comes. Now, as part of a collaboration between the University of Manchester and the University of Oxford, um, Zooms was applied to hundreds and hundreds of bones from the niece of the cave. And it is great that they persevered with doing this because when they got to bone number 1,227, they finally found a bone that gave the signature of being of hominin source. This is a very small bone, only 2.5 centimeters long. And when we got it in Leipzig for genetic analyses, the first thing that we did was to look at the mitochondrial DNA. And indeed, we saw that the mitochondrial DNA of this individual fell within the variation of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, thus confirming the identification of this bone as being hominin based on its collagen, and after which it was given the official name of the niece of 11. Now, mitochondrial DNA is very useful um, for taxonomic um, analyses, but of course, being inherited only through the maternal lineage um, we only get a partial story of the population of these um, individuals. So to get a clearer picture, we then went back to the bone, sampled it further, and by shotgun sequencing, um, were able to reconstruct this um, individual's genome to an average coverage of 2.6 fold. And of course, I understand that many of you are not in the ancient DNA world, so I'll just say that this shows quite unusual, uh, unusually um, good preservation when we're talking about remains that are tens of thousands of years old. So coming from the niece of a cave, this individual could potentially be a Neanderthal and it could potentially be a Denisovan since both archaic groups have been found at the site. 
So when we have a low coverage genome to be able to determine from which group it comes, what we do is that we take advantage of the high coverage genomes um, that were sequenced from both these groups, the high coverage Neanderthal genome and the high coverage Denisovan genome. And what we do is that we look for positions in the Neanderthal genome where she carries a derived allele, whereas the Denisovan and a present day human are ancestral. And then we ask, how often is it the case that the, the DNA fragments from our test individual matches these Neanderthal alleles? We then do the same thing by looking for um, derived alleles in the Denisovan genome where the Neanderthal and present day humans are ancestral and ask how often our test genome matches those with the expectation that a Neanderthal individual will more often match the Neanderthal alleles and a Denisovan individual will more often carry the Denisovan alleles. And when we did that for Denisova 11, uh, we saw something that we had never seen before. And that is that she carried both Neanderthal and Denisovan alleles in approximately equal proportions. In other words, this ancient individual had both Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry in approximately equal extents. So there are several scenarios that could explain um, or account for this signal of mixed Neanderthal Denisovan ancestry that we saw in Denisova 11. And for the sake of clarity um, and brevity today, I only show you the two most extreme possible scenarios. So Denisova 11 could have mixed Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry if her parents came from a population where everyone has both Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry, a population we simply hadn't um, sampled before. Or she could have mixed Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry if she had one parent that is a Neanderthal and one parent that is a Denisovan. So to tell these two scenarios apart, we again uh, make use of the high coverage uh, genomes that we have available. And this time we're looking at positions in the genome where the Denisovan is homozygous from one allele and the Neanderthal is homozygous for a different allele. At these positions, <clears throat> sorry, we then draw randomly two DNA fragments from Denisova 11. And we ask how often is it the case that one fragment carries the Neanderthal allele and one fragment carries the Denisovan allele and compare that to our expectations under the different scenarios. So if I start with our expectations under the scenario of a parental population that is of mixed Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry, we would expect to see these cases where one fragment is Neanderthal-like and one fragment is Denisovan-like shown in purple in 25% of cases. Whereas under the scenario of one parent uh, from each of these two different archaic populations, we would expect to see these cases um, in 50% of cases. And then we look at the real data and we saw that it fits best our expectation under the second scenario. This then allows us to reconstruct the family tree of this ancient individual, since we know she had then one Neanderthal parent and one Denisovan parent and her mitochondrial DNA is Neanderthal-like, we were able to determine that Denisova 11 was the daughter of a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father. Our next step was to look at these cases where um, in two DNA fragments, uh, one is Neanderthal and one is Denisovan across the entire genome. And you see here in the y-axis, each lane is one chromosome. And as one would expect from a first generation offspring of these two different archaic groups, um, these purple cases, these mixed cases are spread out homogeneously throughout the genome. Except, except that we saw that there were five very small regions in the genome that diverged from the genome wide average. And if I sort of zoom in onto one of those, so you see what I mean, in these very small regions, when you draw two DNA fragments from Denisova 11, they both tend to carry the Neanderthal allele. And that can only be if the Denisovan father himself had some Neanderthal ancestry that he then passed along to his daughter. We then did some simulation where we varied the amount of admixture between Neanderthals and Denisovans and the number of generations since this admixture event happened. What you're looking at is a maximum likelihood plot with the lighter color being more likely. And from this, we could deduce that the Denisovan father had a Neanderthal ancestor or ancestors 
some 300 to 600 generations before he lived. We can then um, take Denise over 11 and put her genome into context of archaic genomes that were sequenced before. So we only have one Denisovan high coverage genome, so the Denisovan father will be somewhere along this lineage. And we can infer that the lineage leading to the Denisovan father splits from the lineage leading to the high coverage Denisovan genome some 7,000 years before she lived. So we place him here. Now for the maternal side, we know that um, there, there is the um, high coverage Neanderthal genome from Denisova cave and one from Croatia. And to our surprise, we saw that the Neanderthal mother actually has more genetic affinity to the Neanderthal from Croatia and that she split about 40,000 years before that. So we place her here, allowing us to infer that Denisova 11 lived some 90,000 years ago. So these needs to be explained. How come Denisova 11's mother shares more genetic affinities with a Neanderthal that lived thousands of kilometers away compared to a Neanderthal from the very same cave? So one option is that the common ancestor of all these Neanderthals lived somewhere in the East and then gave rise to the lineage of the Altai Neanderthal as well as to Denisova and Evans' mother's lineage. And later there were migrations towards the West leading to the Croatian Neanderthals. Or the common ancestor lived more in the West and there were migrations towards the East leading to these two lineages. And these are two non-mutually exclusive scenarios that we could possibly resolve by sequencing the genome of older Neanderthals. Now we haven't gotten there yet, but last year we were able to recover DNA from a 120,000 year old Neanderthal from Germany. And we could test whether it was more like the Neanderthal from the East, the Neanderthal from Croatia in the West or ancestral to both. And if you focus on the third type of analysis that we did, we saw that the highest support was that this individual already looks like what we see later on in Croatia, finding from support for the possibility of migrations towards the East. So in the genome of Denisova 11, we find multiple admixture events, once between her parents and at least once in the family history of the father. And so one question that came up when we find this mixed offspring was what are the odds of finding this in the archeological record? So to try and get a grasp of this, um, we, I'm showing you here all the Neanderthals in blue where nuclear DNA has been sequenced, the Denisovans are in red, and ancient modern humans that are at least 40,000 years old are shown in yellow. 40,000 years old, meaning they could have potentially met archaic hominins. And out of these quite few individuals, we have Oase one an ancient modern human from Romania that based on his genome showed that he had a Neanderthal ancestor some four to six generations before he lived. We have Denisova 3, the high coverage Denisovan genome, where we also saw some traces of Neanderthal ancestry in her genome. And then of course we have this mixed offspring, Denisova 11. So looking at this, what seems to emerge is that admixture between these different groups of hominins must have been frequent. Of course, one must take into account that not all of these individuals had even the opportunity in their lifetimes to meet someone from another group. In fact, the overlap between Neanderthals and Denisovans may have been quite restricted, not only in time, but also in space. And it is that along with the possibility of some incompatibility or selection against missed offsprings that makes us refine that statement by saying that at this time period and possibly throughout human evolution, admixture between different groups of hominin must have been frequent when these people had the opportunity to meet. And whether these genetic exchanges were also accompanied by cultural ones remains a matter of debate. And with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators who participated in the work that I presented today. Um, a lot, a very uh, big thank you to the organizers of the symposium and to Science Abroad for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vivian, for this excellent talk. Um, okay.
I would like to ask our panelists if you have any questions uh, for Vivian, you can unmute or you can also ask in the chat and I will ask. If not, we already have a Q&A from the attendees. Um, on dead micelles, um, ask what is the source of sedimental DNA? And if these are decaying bodies, why weren't bones found? Yes, very good question. The answer to which is we're not sure what is the source of DNA in sediments. Um, it has been hypothesized before, and, and we also think uh, similarly that any body fluid uh, that you could think of uh, could be a source of DNA in sediments. Um, possibly we're talking about fecal matter that sort of becomes sediments. Um, and this is uh, something we think because um, when we looked at the content of hominin DNA, when we take one sediment sample and sort of take little aliquots out of it, the content of, of, of hominin DNA is, is quite similar. It's quite homogeneous, making it seem like it's sort of spread out. Now, we did have one outlier um, in the niece of a cave where we took one sediment sample and we took an aliquot and it had um, more than 50 times more um, ancient hominin DNA than other aliquots. And what we think happened there um, is that there was a tiny piece of bone fragment or tooth fragment um, that was sort of too small to be even seen or, or identified and that was sequenced there. So it's not that there are no bones, uh, it is sometimes they're just reduced to powder. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Um, do we have any more questions from the crowd or panelists? You can unmute and ask. Yes, I wanted to ask a question. That was really yeah. interesting. Uh, can you say anything about the affected population sizes uh, of these two groups from the DNA you collect? Um, yes, from the high coverage genomes. Um, and specifically, um, there's a paper that came out just a few months ago from the third high coverage genome from Chakilska K, uh, where um, it was looked at this question. So in general, um, um, if you're familiar with PSMC plots, um, the effective population size of Neanderthals and Denisovans were smaller uh, than ancient modern humans. And as you follow them in time, they sort of drop, drop, drop until they essentially go um, extinct, um, which is about at the same time where the population size of humans um, sort of grows um, and grows. Uh, we can also say something about the group sizes. Um, so the genetic diversity um, of Neanderthals is smaller than that of Denisovans. So we think that Neanderthals, especially those living in the east, sort of at the edge of their territory, um, lived in smaller groups than Denisovans did and then ancient modern humans did. 